Welcome back to Face the Nation and our 68-year CBS News tradition, the CBS News Correspondents' Year-End Roundtable. Joining me today, National Security Correspondent David Martin and Chief Justice and Homeland Security Correspondent Jeff Pegues, plus Chief Washington Correspondents Major Garrett and CBS News Correspondent Paula Reed, who interrupted her visit to her new in-laws to Ooh. join us this morning. Thank you very much, Paula, for being here. Thank a lot you. of interruptions this week. And a lot of chiefs at the table, too. <laughs> I, I, too many chiefs. <laughs> and way too many headlines. But David, I want to start off with you. Uh, this Mattis resignation. Um, he clearly quit based on that letter where he laid out uh, fundamental differences that he has with the president. What happens next? Well, we don't know. Uh, for one thing, the resignation was not going to take effect until the end of February, so he would be on the job for effectively two more months through the creation of the new budget uh, through a, uh, another uh, meeting of uh, NATO defense chiefs. But we are getting indications this morning that he may be going right now. Mm. Um, that he was fired, essentially, told to... We, uh, we have a statement from the Pentagon saying the Secretary of Defense serves at the pleasure of the president. And uh, I interpret that as, as meaning that the secretary has been asked to uh, go at once. I don't have confirmation of that, but that's how I interpret that statement. What does that mean in the immediate sense? Who steps up? Well, the, uh, the Deputy Secretary of Defense is a man named Patrick Shanahan. Most people uh, never hear uh, the name of the Deputy Secretary of Defense. He's uh, got an ex uh, a lifetime of experience uh, with Boeing building airplanes. Uh, he likes to say he's built more airplanes than anybody in the world, and it's, it's uh, probably true. He's in charge of uh, President Trump's uh, pet project of uh, creating a space force, so he's had a number of dealings with, uh, with President Trump. He's obviously not the military expert that uh, uh, Mattis is, but what you really need to run the Pentagon is executive expertise and skills. So the fact that he's not a, a military expert uh, does not mean that he can't be an effective acting Secretary of Defense. And at the White House, the only name that has surfaced with any specificity has been Patrick Shanahan as a replacement. This was a couple of days ago. And on the Hill, the soundings I've received is that because he's been confirmed already, he might have an easier confirmation process while the administration has so many confirmation battles ahead of it. Interior Secretary, Attorney General, UN Ambassador, et cetera, et cetera. This might be a person who could take that position, pay attention to procurement, maintenance, Space Force, mm -hmm. and leave maybe some of the larger policy questions to Secretary of State Pompeo and the National Security Advisor John Bolton. That would certainly please the two of them. Major, if, if what David is saying, he's sort of reading between the lines of that Pentagon statement is true, that... Well, that always means the same thing. Fired. I serve at the pleasure of the president. If the president is displeased, I'm out. Well, we clearly how... saw from these tweets last night that <clears throat> where the president fairly... That's what it historically Mattis has meant. ...and Brett McGurk, yeah. uh, that he's very mm -hmm. frustrated. What has actually happened? Is it just the media coverage of, of how this went down, or what would have triggered the president to say February 28th is way too long for Mattis to stay at post? That the criticism is too intense, that it's getting too much traction. And stepping back for a second, there's been this thought of the stabilizing forces around the president, whether it was John Kelly, Secretary Mattis, for a while, Rex Tillerson, etc. Perhaps what the country actually needs is what it voted for, the actual undiluted approach to national security questions that this president campaigned on, which is what he says in his defense he's now doing. I told you I wanted to get out of Syria. I told you I didn't want to have endless wars. I told you I wanted to come back home. Now I'm doing it. Forget about the process. Forget about the communication strategy. I'm doing what I told you. Watch it, look it, evaluate it. Perhaps with the guardrails now less close to this president, the country is going to get what it voted for and what actually is closer to his core instincts. We'll decide if we're comfortable with that. David, what are your thoughts on what Major just laid out there? Is Shanahan to stay, or are we going to see other nominees that perhaps the Pentagon would like to see at the helm? Well, I've, uh, the, the other names you hear are the retired Army General uh, Jack Keene and uh, Senator Tom Cotton. Uh, uh, Keene is about to turn 76, and, and that's getting up there for a job as uh, demanding as uh, Secretary of Defense, and both Keene and uh, Cotton are opposed to the uh, Syria pullout, so uh, they don't seem like natural uh, fits. Uh, 
I, I agree very much with what uh, Major just said. It, the story all along about President Trump has been that he blows off intelligence briefings. You can't change his mind. But now what's changed is he is taking decisions based on his instincts, not just telling people not to bother him with these arguments. He's making decisions based on his instincts. And we saw a similar pattern play out, Jeff, uh, this week with the back and forth over what the president would actually agree to in terms of funding and border security measures. You know, first, Republicans thought they could get something through without border wall funding. Now that's what we're shutting down the government around. Yeah, there was a deal, then there wasn't a deal. There's not a deal now, and it could go on beyond Christmas. And there are some federal employees right now who don't know as they head into Christmas when they will get their next paycheck. But obviously, this is the president who, who feels like this may be his last chance to get that border wall. He wants $5 billion. The Democrats were offering 1.6, but now they feel emboldened, I think, and they lowered their number down to 1.3. So we're at a stalemate now. And the question is, when will this be resolved? And when will we see the uh, current Secretary of Homeland Security remain at post. I mean, is, does she have uh, an expiration date on her, as many are predicting? Well, I, I think we've been waiting for that shoe to drop, especially after General Kelly was announced that he was going to leave. And he is someone uh, who is sort of a mentor for her. So when he left, or uh, when word right. exactly, you know, there were those of us uh, who cover Homeland Security wondering, well, could she be next? Uh, that's what we're expecting uh, with Kelly on the way out. And Paula, a lot of new blood in the new year, potentially. Uh, at the moment, we have an acting attorney general uh, and some news around him this week as it pertains to what the Justice Department recommended ethics wise. And that was that he recused himself from any kind of dealings with the Russia probe, something that the prior AG had been fired for doing in the first place. What do people need to understand about this decision? Two big headlines coming out this week about Whitaker and his role in the Russia investigation. The first is that we learned he has never received any briefings about the Mueller probe so far. So that means everything that happened so far with Cohen, anything that's gone on the special counsel, that has still been approved by Rod Rosenstein, not acting Attorney General Whitaker. Then we learned that ethics officials said that if Whitaker asked, they would advise that he recuse out of an abundance of caution based on these criticisms uh, of, of the special counsel that he made before he came to the Justice Department. But Whitaker never asked. And so he has made a decision uh, that he will take over the supervising role of the special counsel investigation going forward. He will begin to receive briefings. He and Rod Rosenstein will jointly oversee the special counsel investigation until an attorney general is confirmed. And do we have any prediction of when that could take place? No, but we got a preview of what that confirmation battle, as Major noted, one of many will start to look like because we had this memo surface written by Barr. He sent this unsolicited memo to the Deputy Attorney General laying out a pretty stark criticism of one of the central veins of the special counsel probe, which is obstruction of justice. Uh, Barr argues that the president couldn't possibly obstruct justice if he was working within his powers. He has the right to fire the FBI director. He has the right to dangle pardons. Many legal scholars have made this argument, but Barr sort of took it to an 11. And uh, now people are concerned that if he does take over supervision of the special counsel investigation, that he may be willing to shut down that aspect of the probe. Last time you were here, which wasn't too long ago, you <laughs> said, I think, February or March for the end of the Mueller probe, or at least until then. You stick by that? I do, because you have so many things that need to be wrapped up. We've been hearing for months that people say, well, I think it's going to wrap up. I think it's going to wrap up. Well, I don't. And there are several reasons for that. One, Mike Flynn's sentencing uh, won't happen anytime before March. You also have uh, the grand jury continues to hear additional witnesses. We expect new indictments. You also have the special counsel fighting subpoenas in court. Paul Manafort won't be sentenced until February and then March. The special counsel's office continues to exist until every single discrete case is wrapped up. I don't see that happening before the end of March. I, th I think it's interesting that a lot of people have put a clock on this thing, but when you look at past special counsel investigations, uh, you know, Benghazi, that took two years, uh, and some of the others have taken four years. This is 19 months into the special counsel investigation. The FBI had it first, of course, but 19 months into Robert Mueller's investigation. 
And Major, there's really little part of the Trump empire or Trump White House that's not being probed or investigated at this point. Not all by the special counsel. Right. Uh, their scrutiny will be applied by this new incoming House Democratic majority for mm -hmm. sure. There are other lawsuits about the emoluments clause taking either foreign or domestic revenue at the Trump Hotel or Trump properties. Is that a violation? Lots of things are being investigated. There is a sense that the White House better person up for this, increase the number of lawyers in the White House Counsel's Office. That process is ongoing. It's not are nearly complete. I don't think you're ever at fully prepared. And I would say if you were to use any statistic or metric that other previous administrations used on the preparation front, they would be far beneath that. We have one of the things special counsel not affected by the partial government shutdown. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Funded fully. Yes. So, so no backdoor shutdown that way. Um, we have a lot more to talk about, including your predictions for the year ahead, if you're brave enough to make them in this news environment. But we're going to take a quick break. Stay with us. And we're back now with our CBS News panel. There is so much we have to digest every week that I feel like all of us always look at ourselves and say, gosh, why didn't I get in that one story or that one point? <laughs> David, for you, what is the most underreported story that we need to know about? To me, it's the uh, new national defense strategy because uh, as Secretary Mattis uh, outlined it, now competition with China and Russia, not the war on terror is going to be the primary focus of the uh, of the Trump administration and of, of U.S. national security. And that means that this giant super tanker that is the United States military is starting to turn away from whack-a-mole with terrorists toward building up the military to be able to compete on a uh, at a high end of conflict. And long after we've uh, stopped arguing about uh, how many troops we should have had in Syria and how long this is going to continue to play out because it's reflected in in the Pentagon budget, which of course takes years and years to play out. So this is this is a major change in the direction of of U.S. foreign policy and, and national security policy, and I think one that's compatible with uh, the president's uh, "Make America Great Again." Um, ethos. So I, I think that's, we're going to see a big change. Jeff, for you? You know, with all this talk about pulling out from Syria and Afghanistan, I talked to officials at the FBI who say the number of ISIS-related investigations that they have ongoing is still at about a thousand. Mm -hmm. You know, that number has been there for about three or four years now. So they're still facing these threats from people who are inspired by that ideology. So with all of this talk about pulling the troops out, they are still facing this daily threat of people who are going online and, and watching what's happening in Syria and Afghanistan and Iraq and are uh, inspired by that ideology still. Still influential. Paula, for you, what has been underreported on your very quiet beat for Justice Department? <laughs> and the one story I'd love to pay more attention to is, is the opioid crisis and the evolution of that crisis. We're seeing a record number of deaths, but right now that is being driven more by synthetic opioids called fentanyls. Meanwhile, government policy continues to focus on prescription <laughs> opioids. So that is something that if I had more time, I would certainly be focusing on. And we heard President Trump mention that uh, as a success out of his meeting with Xi Jinping, mm -hmm. that he would change how uh, fentanyl was handled uh, internally in his country. Major, for you, what has been underreported? So there is a narrative that exists for a good reason, because we feel it every day of this sense of chaos and constant polarized clash in Washington. But on certain issues, and I watched it in the Oval Office for nearly an hour just at the end of this week, there are bipartisan efforts that do succeed and make a big difference. Criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. Van Jones, standing in the Oval Office, across from Jared Kushner and Ralph Reed, all complementing each other on a coalition that created a significant alteration in American federal criminal justice for the first time in 30 years. The Farm Bill. Does that affect us here on the East Coast or the West Coast? No, but in the center of the country, it makes a huge deal. Opioids has at a policy level and at an appropriations level reached a level of critical mass on a bipartisan basis under this president's leadership. Now, is the president responsible for that? Largely no. Why are these successes occurring? Because actual legislators 
are doing legislative work with the president's approval, working out all the hard details, getting the president to sign off, and making things happen. So yes, there is a sense of chaos and polarization on macro issues and some of the ones that grab all the headlines. But there is functionality. And it was mm -hmm. working on a bipartisan yeah. basis, and not everything is chaotic and not going anywhere. But it was interesting how it, it didn't take long for that message of unity to get trounced upon because right. of the shutdown. You had the, the criminal justice reform, something mm -hmm. that people have been working on for years, and it was overshadowed. The sort president of is uniquely the capable of stomping into submission his very own good news. I will put in a point of privilege since I still am foreign policy correspondent here. Uh, one of the things I think has been underreported um, is a human rights issue, and that is what's happening in China. Uh, you have reports from the State Department that between 800,000 and 2 million Muslims have been put in internment camps. Nikki Haley says this is the largest internment of people since World War II. There's been calls for sanctions on Capitol Hill, but we don't hear about it um, much in the conversations at the presidential level, certainly with Xi Jinping, we didn't hear about it. Um, I now want to go into really dangerous territory, <laughs> which is to try to predict what is coming at us in 2019. David, um, what should we expect uh, at a Pentagon where we don't yet know who the leadership will be? Well, just reading the uh, handwriting on the wall, the president has said that the annual military exercises with South Korea are both provocative and, and too expensive. So I predict that uh, when he meets with uh, Kim Jong-un in January or February, he will uh, offer the concession of suspending the spring exercises, or not suspending, but canceling the, the spring exercises with South Korea in return for some sort of concession on North Korea's nuclear weapons program. And that will allow him to uh, continue to maintain, despite all of the intelligence to the contrary, that the uh, North Korean uh, nuclear threat has been eliminated. And I think it's worth pointing out here on that prediction that your 2016 prediction of Trump and Kim Jong-un meeting came true. <laughs> so take notes on what David okay. just laid out. Although I think you also did say that Baghdadi was going to be taken out and he seems to still be in at least deep, deep hiding. We, w we, we wait to see. <laughs> we will wait to see. Always take notes of what David Martin says. <laughs> Always. That's Always. just All of the us bottom do. line. That is absolutely the case. Jeff, what is your prediction? Um, I am predicting that Mueller will find an element of collusion, conspiracy. Whether it's enough mm -hmm. in this political atmosphere, we'll see. But if you look at the pace of that investigation and the way that he has rolled up cooperating witnesses, mm -hmm. I think it's remarkable. If it were any other investigation, uh, I think that type of police work, if you will, would get a, a lot of attention. We have more than 33 indictments and guilty pleas in 19 months. It's remarkable. And I think it's heading towards something that will give the American public uh, a conclusion. Quickly, Major and Paul. I said Saudi Arabia was a huge issue last year in my predictions. I go back to that. Yemen and Syria are vectoring off the Saudi relationship. The death of Jamal Khashoggi and what this administration does or doesn't make of it is going to fundamentally alter our Middle East policy and Pompeo's on it. Paul? There is no guarantee the Mueller report will be made public. I predict it will set off a massive legal fight uh, to make that full document public. Mitty's peace plan is supposed to be coming out by spring. That is what we're hearing. They've got 50 pages of it. Stay mm. tuned. We'll be back in a moment with a look at what one member of Congress is doing to try and make for better bipartisan relations on Capitol Hill. With all the partisanship in Washington today, we thought we'd leave you with a story about what one Democrat is doing to bring some holiday cheer to his colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Fruitcake. It's the holiday season's most despised dessert. But for the last 22 years, Oregon Democratic Congressman Earl Blumenauer has been lobbying his fellow lawmakers to join the Confections Caucus. We're doing a little drive-by caking. Right, drive-by caking here. Drive-by fruit caking. That means surprising his colleagues with a treat he's loved since childhood. He makes hundreds every year over his Thanksgiving holiday. It's just kind of a, a holiday ritual, to, you know, yeah. baking, separating 
dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of eggs. Over a thousand eggs, in fact. Blumenauer makes his deliveries in the offices and halls of the Capitol, each one complete with a shot of Portland area pear brandy. I know you don't drink, yeah. but we have brandy for the staff for the okay, cake okay. if it, if it uh, makes sense. Yes, that's fine. I would pass it on to them. Great. So could I just taste a sample You right can, now? right there. Very tasty. Here is brandy that some eat with fruitcake, some douse it, some just drink it. <laughs> the congressman's fruitcake is welcome at any party, even the grand old party. He delivers to his Republican colleagues as well. Hey, 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 this is awesome. Who says fruitcake's no good? It's pretty good. But just Republicans on the Hill. You should run over to the White House with that. No. <laughs> Want to sample a piece of fruitcake? You know what? You don't have to. This, is, this will be my only fruitcake of the, of the Christmas century. Season, so that's right. <laughs> For you, anything. Well, Any sacrifice. I'm sure it's a, a sacrifice. <laughs> but when even a taste is a sacrifice, why does he do it? He says it forms a connection with his colleagues that he can't get anywhere else. And he hopes that the spirit of giving something one hates a try might just make its way into the House chamber. One of the best guys you get to work with in Washington, D.C. The congressman says he pays for it all himself. Well, fruitcake's just one of the traditions. Next week on Face the Nation, we'll have another. We'll speak with historians Doris Kearns Goodwin, Michael Beschloss, Jill Lepore, and Peter Baker. They'll all be here to talk about their new books and leadership. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching. We want to wish you all a Merry Christmas and a very happy holiday season. Until next week for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.